Hello, everybody. Have you had a good day at the conference so far? Yeah. Cool. It's been spectacular, hasn't it? It's always an excellent conference. Well, thank you to all the organizers. First day, spectacular. Looking forward to the rest of the days. However, this is the piece de resistance. This is my favorite part of the ACC conference every single year. And uh, we have a program for you tonight. So who hasn't been to Lightning Talk to ACCU before? Hands up. There's a few of you. Okay, cool. You're in for a treat. So, lightning talks. These are a quick fire set of back-to-back -back talks. The rules are very simple. The subjects are completely open, but we're all geeks. Um, the talks, five minutes tops. Now, I'm very strict about this, and this is part of the jeopardy. If anybody goes over five minutes, I will forcibly eject them from the stage in a manner compliant with health and safety and uh, the code of conduct. I'll push you off the stage. This is going to be a lot of fun. We have a wide range of topics. There's absurdity, uh, there's, there's code, as I said. You're going to enjoy this. And just remember, if the person you're listening to is really boring, five minutes' time, you've got someone else anyway. It's all good. Okay, so. Why don't eggs tell jokes to each other? Because they crack each other up. Doesn't get any better than that. Buckle down. Okay, so this is your order of uh, proceedings for the evening, and we will start this evening with Mr. Dom Davis and Autistic, which hurts. Dan is up. Thank you. Dan is up. We jump up here. Uh, can't see slides. Can't see. Yes, I can. We. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've all guessed this is autism. Um, it, it sort of. Um, this is the IPA phonetic thing. If you don't know. Um, it takes on the fact that uh, or, as in Australia, not as in gold, uh, sounds very similar to or, and, you know, you put a little bit of an accent on there, and it, it, it sounds the same. Um, while uh, do, I didn't do, uh, what was it? I did uh, logical autism, if you've been really pedantic, and, and, and we like pedants. Uh, I didn't do bitwise autism because I thought that the Unix people among you would think it was pipedism. Um, and and uh, while researching this, I was trying to look for a BAP emoji because, yeah, that's my brain. Um, so, uh, yes, autism. Um, this makes it uh, a tism. And that's good, because I don't want it to be an ism. Uh, isms are bad. Racism, sexism, fascism, alcoholism. Um, and isms imply ists. So racist, sexist, fascist, alcoholist. Um, okay, the last one's alcoholic, but it's, it's the exception that proves the rule. Um, so I am not an autist, although I do know my spell checker doesn't complain about that word. Um, I am not an autic. That's, that's not me either. I am autistic. Um, so what? <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Um, but it turns out that there's a few of us in this industry, and I'm going to guess I'm not the only one in here. We're, we're everywhere. Um, so let's, let's address some biggies. Let's, let's talk about this. Uh, you don't look autistic. Uh, okay. Um, what does an autistic look like? I don't know. I am a level one autistic, apparently. Um, I have no idea what this means. Um, I am also high functioning, although we don't use the term high functioning. Um, may have used Asperger's in the past, but we don't use that term anymore. These, these bad Asperger's has been got rid of. It's all now autism, and high functioning implies a low functioning, so we can't use it. Um, so, at level one autism, and it implies that I should autism harder. Um, <laughs> And, and, and become level two. Um, uh, also, just incidentally, autistic spectrum disorder is the DSM thing for it. Uh, and they're, they're phasing this out as well because this is, this is also bad disorder. Um, so they have autistic spectrum condition, ASC, which I object to. I do not want my sort order <laughs> defined by my condition. Um, I might want to do this, especially if it's condescending. Um, so no, I, I don't look autistic, um, although every single picture I asked for when I said to Ida, could I have a picture of me not looking autistic, she's like, how about this? And then, mm, no. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes I do. Um, this is me actually having an autistic meltdown, and this doesn't tell you anything, really, other than I'm hiding. I've actually gone non-visual at this point. I can't open my eyes. I can't process the data. Um, the world is against me. Um, and I don't look autistic because I mask. Now, everyone masks. Everyone in this room does it, regardless of your um, mental health. But uh, I do it to a slightly higher degree. And I have to you know, make sure, am I making eye contact, or at least pretending I'm making eye contact? Um, am I uh, allowing people to speak? 
because otherwise you won't get a word in edgeways. Um, am I remembering the social norms and the correct social norms of the group I'm in? Um, am I being inappropriate? Probably, yes. Um, uh, and don't be weird. As, uh, <laughs> one of the things I need to stop myself from doing is overhearing people that are wrong, patently wrong, and going, you're wrong. Um, because it, it turns out that my correctile dysfunction is uh, supercharged. Um, so yeah, I, I do not look autistic because I have practiced for years and years and years and years. Um, okay, so you're, you're not disabled. Um, <laughs> the UK government would disagree with you there. Um, I, uh, when I'm like this, I am hideously disabled. It's, um, it's scary. Don't have time to go into what actually happens, but if you want to learn more about it, do do come up and, and, and talk. Um, so do I need to tread on eggshells around me? No. Um, I may go disappear. I may walk out of the room. It may be something that you said. Deal with it. I will. Um, so I go back to so what? Hopefully, hopefully people will ask. People will talk about it. You may come up and speak to me about it. You may remember that I have this condition. You may not remember me at all. I, it's entirely up to you. Um, all I want to do is highlight it and get us talking about it. Um, <laughs> it's almost like I've done these before. <laughs> I needed people to read, and some people take longer to read than others. <laughs> do come up and speak to me if you want to know more. Don't hurt me. Ah, ah, ah. Thank you, Dom. Excellent. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Ten tickles, yes. Next up, ooh, up is down. Next up, we have Jim with Why IT Projects Fail. Oh, dear. One too many hands. One too many hands. Right. Before I begin, I'm um, talking about why IT projects fail, which is taken from this book, which fell out of one of the boxes I was unpacking this morning, uh, selling off the dear late Hubert Matthews, uh, the good bits of his book collection. And I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of you so far. We've still got some books left, but so far for Code Club, we have raised over £410, which is... <laughs> Which is a stonking effort, and thank you so, so, so much. This is the book I'm waving around. Hubert gave it to me once to read, and it's got a very interesting list on it, a set of categories of why IT projects fail. And at this point, this stops being a lightning talk, and I give you all the work to do because this is a lightning read. <laughs> Here we go. We've divided the reasons projects fail into various headline categories. This is the list of project conception root causes, or possibly some of them. I can never remember how many slides there are. Oh, good. We've got as far as project initialization and mobilization. Are any of these looking familiar by any chance? Every time I read this list, I'm sitting there going, yep, yep, bloody hell, yep, yep. Seen that one. Here's the second. Is, did, did that go to the second page? Good, good, good. Keep reading. You're not here to enjoy yourselves. <laughs> oh, we're finally going to get around as far as system design. Here's some more things to worry about. God, this is getting a little bit, a little bit scary, isn't it? Because there's more system design reasons. These are just root causes, remember, or they're identified in the book as root causes. The book was written by a senior IBM uh, engineer who'd done a lot of consulting and seen, obviously seen a lot of complete car crashes. Finally, we're getting around to system implementation and operation, and of course, disposal once the uh, system is finished. Now, there's a couple of takeaways from this. First of all, problems are mostly rooted in conception to design, 
not development and subsequent phases. And look at the big one from the bottom. Only a small number, a tiny number, are actually technology problems. So, what's the moral of this story? Well, the moral is very simple. Douglas Adams was right. As his summary of the summary of the summary of the problem says, it's the people, stupid. <laughs> so, thanks again. Please come and visit the bookstall. See if you can snarf up a few more elderly or not so elderly volumes. I'll look forward to seeing you around. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. The past, the present, and the future walk into a bar. It was tense. Next up, Kevlin. Where are you, Kevlin? Nobody laugh at him. I don't know where Pete gets these from, but we need to find out where and stop it. <laughs> okay, where's the uh, magic numbers? Aha, excellent, right. Let's just see if this goes in the right direction. Nope, there it is. Yeah, excellent, right. Algorithm, you keep using that word. No, I'm not talking about the misnamed C++ include header. And if you don't know why it's misnamed, we need to have a talk about what an algorithm actually is. And we're going to do that. I'm talking about this version. These days, popular use of the word algorithm is morphing. It is increasingly used to describe almost anything that a computer accomplishes. That includes the realms of artificial intelligence and machine learning. My mother-in-law recently presented me with a new word. She said, there's something, it's algorithm. And I said, that's strangely appropriate. <laughs> We've been using those for millennia. There's a good definition in this rather wonderful book um, about kind of logic and the limits of logic, framed as a biography of Bertrand Russell, excellent uh, uh, graphic novel, breaks the fourth wall, talks about a whole bunch of stuff, including algorithms, bizarrely enough. Um, a methodical step-by-step -step procedure, described in terms of totally unambiguous instructions, which starts at a specified initial condition, and eventually terminates with a desired outcome, which means basically things like BOGO sort do not qualify as algorithms, because they are not guaranteed to terminate. Um, now, I wrote a series of blog posts on esoteric sorting algorithms, and uh, including bogus sort, but, um, which may or may not be an algorithm, but permutation sort certainly is. And this is an awesome algorithm. Um, basically, it has factorial time complexity, uh, which is a totally OMG complexity. Um, in essence, it is an unoptimized search through the permutations of the input values until it finds the one arrangement that is sorted. Awesome. If you do it in C++, it's a very elegant, small um, uh, implementation. If you do it in Python, it's pretty small, except for the fact that Python doesn't have a way of determining if it's sorted, but you can solve that. That's easy enough. I've done it in Groovy, where you actually have to fire up a whole permutation generator and count for a special case. Now, why is all this relevant? Well, you know, oh yeah, again, you also have to implement it's sorted. Last week, I was in Amsterdam. I was invited to give a keynote at the Kotlin conference. I pointed out that I am not a Kotlin programmer. I am barely even a Kotlin tourist. And they said, that's fine. We just want interesting stuff. I said, right, fine. And I thought that one of the things I would do is also include a narrative that led to Bogo sort, but included permutation sort. And I thought, you know what? I might as well port that to uh, Kotlin. So I did a bit of searching. And I used Twitter. It might, might well have been. No, I've stopped. Um, so I, my Google foo was failing me. I was finding that I was struggling to find the relevant pieces. So enter chat GPT. Does the Kotlin standard library have a way to generate permutations of a list? Yes. Yeah, generate permutations of a list using the permutations function. Awesome. Here's an example usage. Excellent. Here's this will output. Huh, C sharp. Curious. Um, <laughs> Note the permutations function returns a sequence of lists where each list represents a unique permutation, means permutations are generated lazily. This is very specific and also very cool. Okay, so I'm going to write something like this. It's an extension method, permutations sorted. I'm going to iterate through the permutations, and then if I'm sorted, return it. Okay, so I need to find out what does the Kotlin Stein library have a way to check if a list is sorted? Yes, um, you can use the assorted extension function that is available on the list interface. Awesome. So it's going to be used like that. This is very intuitive and gives me code like that. But it's a bit procedural, so we'll kind of like, yeah, that's really nice. That's really elegant. I like that. That's absolutely fantastic, except for one small problem. It's a complete hallucination. 
None of the functions that it so confidently described actually exist, even though they are rendered in loving detail, right down to the fact that lazy evaluation and sequences correctly within Kotlin are used. So I had to come up with my own, and it looked like that, and I ended up interacting with ChatGPT, which first of all produced a version that didn't actually work. In other words, it returned the same, same list the right number of times, you know, three, uh, you know, n factorial times, the same result. I pointed this out, it apologized, gave me another version. Then eventually I said, yeah, but you kind of said you were using sequences here. And so eventually it gave me a sequence version, and I kind of used that, and then a better algorithm, and ended up with this. So anyway, the whole point there is the thing you need to remember. Reality cannot be ignored except at a price. What we have in machine learning is a people pleaser that is a savant and is also sociopathic and easily bought. Okay? It is not required to tell you the truth. It is just required to tell you things that keep you happy. Thank you, Kevlin. Winning the award for getting right down to the wire most accurately. What do you call someone who always states the absolute obvious? Someone who always states the absolute obvious. Okay, next up, come on, that deserved a bigger groan than that. Next up is Andy. Lighten the mood, Andy. <laughs> Middle button. Hello. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about something called spooky action at a distance, which is a phrase that was coined by Albert Einstein. Um, and obviously he was talking about C code. Uh, so here's an example of spooky action at a distance. You've got a global variable user ID, and then later when you want to use it, you pluck it from the ether and you use it. That is spooky action at a distance. Uh, but we don't want to use C. We want to use a high-level language. So let's have a look at Python. Well, in Python, you can do this too. Um, I should point out that I think this is a bad thing. Um, uh, so in Python, you can have a module-level variable. Um, you can just stick it into, maybe not the ether, but somewhere with a name, but it's still a globally accessible thing. When you want to use it later, you just pull it out um, later on. Um, so we don't want to use Python. That's a toy language. We want to use a proper grown-up language. Let's try C++. In C++, well, I mean, we have so many ways to do this. But in C++, we have this way, singletons. Um, you can throw a value which gets lazily created into the ether, and later on you can pull it out. Um, it's globally accessible by one name, but the key advantage of singletons is that you can, that there's only one instance of them, like a global variable. Um, so we don't want to um, stick with C++. C++ is um, difficult. We want something a little bit more enterprise. Let's have a look at Java. In Java, we can use a user info singleton factory producer factory impl, um, put it out of the ether exactly the same way. Um, now, I wasn't sure how to move on to C sharp, but I asked Dom earlier, and he said we could try um, just that we want to use something better. So let's have a look how you might do this in C sharp. Not only C sharp, um, but in C sharp, you can use a dependency injection framework to really obfuscate the fact that you're doing this. So you can you can throw a value into the ether by type, and later on you can pull it back out of the ether by type without ever mentioning a name. Um, but we don't want to use C Sharp, it's too ordinary. We want to use some kind of, something a bit more kitchen sink. So we might try Scala. Now Scala has a, a new, brand new language mechanism for you to do this exact thing. You can also, by type, throw something into the ether. This is Scala 3, by the way, I learned, it, I learned about it yesterday. Um, you can throw something into the ether by type and then pull it out later on by type. Um, now it's, it's a, a magic argument, uh, a magic parameter that you didn't specify that got magically provided to your function. It's incredibly magic. Um, but, but I noticed there's a lot of young people here, so we should use something a little bit younger. Um, and we're on to the reason why I ended up writing this rant. Um, so if you want to use JavaScript, and in particular for using React context, we have a new way of doing spooky action at a distance. You can create a context, 
wrap up your component in that, and then later on when you want to use it, you can pull your value out of the uh, limitedly scoped ether that is your context. Um, and I've read the documentation about why you would want to do this. Uh, and the answer that the uh, React documentation gives is that um, you have a load of, you might have a load of components that don't actually use this value. It's just used by a component embedded inside them, which means, in my opinion, they use that value. Okay, so why do we keep on doing this thing? Um, I think the answer is we don't want to repeat ourselves. And we, what we mean by that is we don't want to um, keep on providing arguments to functions that we just pass on to other functions. So I want to talk to you a little bit about road signs. So there are not that many good things about the United Kingdom. One of the good things about it is when you start driving somewhere on a road sign, this, it, people, some of the young people might not know what these are, but they're by the side of the road. They tell you how to get there. Um, when you, once you've seen Bristol on a sign, you're going to see it on the next sign. Now, well, as we all know, in some countries, road signs look like this. And uh, I've driven in France, and they don't follow this rule. Um, sometimes they put a destination on the road sign, and sometimes they just don't bother for a while, which is a little bit like a React context. What I want to tell you is that road signs are useful. You should repeat yourself in function definitions. Function signatures are useful. Do not turn them into lies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Uh, they've opened a new restaurant on the moon. It's great food, but it's got no atmosphere. Next up is Felix. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, what can possibly be wrong when you join an open source project? Um, in 2015, I listened to a CPP cast, and uh, the guest was Sean Parent, and he talked about the new library that he was writing at that time. And I got curious about this. So, um, I asked if I may join, and I was welcomed. And by accident, I just got to new, new people. I met him, for instance, at a conference the first time in 2017 in uh, Berlin on Meeting C++. And it was a pleasure to meet him. It was, we talked about the whole evening and the next day, and I think we even missed a session. So it was great. Not missing the session, but talking to him. And I learned a lot. Especially in this context, it was about concurrency, generic programming, and functional programming. And people wanted to me uh, that I talk about this. So I start talking about what I learned at uh, our local user group and, and, and on conferences. And suddenly, I could help my colleagues in finding really nasty race conditions, for instance, or reduce uh, or improve the performance on the, our application. And putting all this information on the CV helped me last summer to get immediately a new job. So, who of you is using open source? Well, probably the majority, not tools, libraries, whatever it's on. Who is regularly contribu contributing to open source? It doesn't matter. So, and I, with contribution, I mean writing detailed bug reports is for me a contribution too well. So, Next question is, when do you start to join an open, open source project? This world does work with working community together. Okay? Thanks. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, Felix. Well, wow, super fast. Uh, why do you never see elephants hiding up trees? Because they're so very good at it. Next up, Matthew. Down, right? Yeah. Down is up. Cool. Hi. Uh, if you know about me, uh, you know that I work on historical video games, and especially right now I'm working on one that is set in the 1930s and 1940s uh, called The Heart of Iron. And it's, it's a time that uh, was described by, to give something uh, to the locals, described by Winston Churchill himself as the gathering storm, a period of like 
an upcoming like uh, trouble, but also a bit of great optimism. And again, to stay with the local, there is maybe not a bigger optimist than Neville Chamberlain, a man who thought that this would be peace in our time in September 1938. How could you be so wrong? But I would say that there was maybe a guy who was even more optimistic at that time, and that man is never that Alan Turing himself. And here is why. Because he made this publication in the 1930s that's saying that if you give someone like a piece of paper with a source code, I cannot tell you if it will turn, uh, it will actually terminate. Which, by the way, this guy's the first programmer, right? First code review ever, it doesn't like give you a thumbs up or anything, just says, hey, here's a 20 page thesis about how I cannot review this merge request. Setting a really bad precedent here, I'm just saying. So let's de debunk this thing, all right? Let's, let's write something. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to solve the problem for you right now, live on stage in four minutes. So uh, will this terminate given a given source? And my answer is yes, it will. Don't believe me? I'll show you. Right, so let's start with the basic thing. Like most programs are made to terminate, okay? Like you just do a thing and you return. If you ever use the Unix console, that's the idea. LS, CD, MKDR, it just does the thing in return, okay? Of course, some smartass in the audience would be like, oh yeah, but do we have interactive programs nowadays, right? Like, you know, uh, your, your notepad, your, your, your video games, your, your music player. Like they only return when the programmer actually, like the, the user actually uh, terminates, right? But let's go back to the Greeks, right? Let's go back to basics. We know from Socrates that man is mortal, and you know, he doesn't have time for this shit. So obviously at some point, he will get that pop-up and nobody clicks on the bottom one. Don't lie, I know, you will click this one. Okay, but what if the user is inhumanly patient, okay? Like, this guy is just here to just make me like look like a dumbass on stage. He's like, no, no, I have, I have wisdom, I have, I have, yeah, I have uh, attained enlightenment. My goal in life is to prove Matthew wrong by just in famous, uh, in, in, um, <clears throat> pushing and waiting until this program not terminates, and just just prove me wrong, right? Okay, sure, but bugs, okay, bugs, bugs happen, right? Like this is this is like the biggest CVE ever, like the the, the one I like, the one that C for example, or language of choice here, uh, might be running into. So you know, it doesn't take much, right? Like a one byte memory leak is enough for your program to eventually crash because you run out of memory. But, you know, you know, that will happen, like bugs. Okay, this one is kind of convoluted, but bugs, they're a thing, right? They don't, don't tell me you never had bugs. But okay, what if a programmer is a genius, right? Like, he has the brain power of like 10 million people, writes a very simple, perfect program that will never crash. Well, sure, he does that, and then he goes to bed, and then the next morning he's greeted by like this nice pop-up, like, hi, we've made some, yeah. <laughs> And this is uh, this is uh, AI generating like Turing cr crying in front of his lab. That's a it's a great picture. Uh, okay, right. But what, what what if Turing or whatever whoever he is uh, also remembers to disable Windows updates? You just just say okay, cool. Uh, the next thing is power supply, right? Computers need electricity to run, and you know uh, just just not stating anything special. But let's say your electricity provider realizes that there is two people on the same name and the same address by mistake, and just decides to shut down both, solve the problem, and you wake up without power. Like that, that would never happen, right? But what if it does, and then you run out of power? Well, you have a solution too, right? You can buy one of those things, and it will just keep power running, so you can uh, see the experiment going on. And we could continue on with hardware failures, because this is obviously the next step in our, in our demonstration. But we have the cloud nowadays, we have virtual machines, so you could just make the thing run on the virtual machine, and then copy it in the cloud, make sure that there is always at least one machine with a safe state that can continue to prove that our program will run, right? So this time we solved it, right? It's, it's, it will execute forever, okay? Well, let's go back to Socrates again. Man is mortal, right? So at some point, the observer will die, and nobody, people will forget about this program running, and nobody will be there to see that it actually terminates. And if a program uh, does not terminate, and there's nobody to see it, does it actually terminate, right? That's a, it's a right question. But you know, we can solve that too. We can build a cult that will just be like there to observe this computer. They don't know why because it's been a thousand years, but they're there to observe that the computer actually terminates or doesn't. And then we create like generation ships or whatever to make sure that even if the earth blows up, we can still continue to do that in space. That's great stuff. So this time it will execute forever, right? No, because there's this thing called the heat death of the universe and eventually we're all going to die anyway and the program with us. So yeah, guess what? Turing was wrong, okay? like. Your program will terminate unless it runs forever without any bugs. It's executed on a redundant hardware in an everlasting galaxy. It was observed by a very patient cult that survives through generation and remembers to disable Windows updates. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Awesome. I call that catastrophizing. Um, we've all heard of Murphy's Law, right? Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Have you heard of Cole's Law? It's like thinly cut cabbage. Next up is Roger with Why Wikis Are Bad. 
and I have no slides, so there you go. Um, my title is Wikis are Bad. Who agrees with me? Oh, one or two people do already, jolly good. Uh, I move around a bit as a contractor and you turn up on a new project and you ask a question and they tell you, it's on the wiki. <laughs> Where? Now, if someone says it's in the source code, how do you find it? Grep. Who uses grep? Yep. How do you grep a wiki? It's a search box that finds pages that may once have had some vague, tenuous connection with the word you put in the search term. It's on the internet. Who knows about these things called search engines? Yeah, I, I've, I've heard Ask Jeeves, remember? Ask Jeeves, Alta Vista, who uses Alta Vista? Yeah, yeah. Uh, nowadays, we all use something else. I won't mention it because there are other alternatives available. But we know how to find things on the internet. How do you find things on a wiki? You ask the person who found it last and they point it to you. That seems to be the only way. Now, if the documentation is on the wiki, you may stumble across the page that refers to what you're asking. There's probably more than one such page. How do you know which is the right one? The problem is with wikis is everyone is responsible for the wiki but nobody actually does anything with it. They add their own page. How do you know which is the right page? You don't. Well, the one that was modified most recently, but it might be that someone added a comment saying, don't use this page. It's now the most recently edited page, but not the right one. So what I want is a wiki that the pages gradually go gray. And so you know that this page no one's loved it for quite a long time. It's probably not worth worrying about. So my view on, on wikis is a short-lived wiki might, might be good. A long-lived wiki, it needs curating, and nobody seems to know how to curate a wiki. So my experience is that despite being awfully well-meaning, wikis overall are bad. Thank you. Thank you. Potentially controversial, I call that a dad rant. <laughs> Talking of which, though, I had a great childhood. My dad used to put me in ties and roll me down hills. Oh, those were good years. <laughs> Next up is Jorgen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Middle button. Uh, no, no slides. All right, so I have to preface by saying I stole all of this content. <laughs> Um, so thanks, James, Irie, and his contributors. So in 1801, uh, Joseph Marie Chacard uses punch cards to instruct a loom to weave Hello World into tapestry. Redditors at the time are not impressed due to the lack of tail call recursion, concurrency, or proper capitalization. <laughs> Later on in 1842, Ada Lovelace writes the first program. She is hampered in her efforts uh, by the minor inconvenience <laughs> that she doesn't have an actual computer to run her code. Enterprise architects will later relearn this technique to program in UML. <laughs> in 1936, Alan Turing invents every programming language that will ever be, but is slightly hampered by the British intelligence to be a 007 before he can patent them. Uh, in, also in 1936, uh, Alonso Church invents every language that will ever be, but does it better, sorry. His lambda calculus is ignored because it's insufficiently C-like. Uh, this criticism, of course, occurs in spite of the fact that C hasn't been invented yet. In the 1940s, various computers, I use that word, word very generously, are programmed using direct wires and switches. And the engineers, they do this in order to avoid the tabs versus spaces debate. In 1957, John Backus uh, invents Fortran at IBM. There's nothing funny about IBM or Fortran, but it is a syntax error to write it without a tie. In 1958, John McCarthy uh, invents Lisp. Due to a high cost, uh, due to depletion of uh, the post-war depletion, sorry, of strategic parentheses reserve, Lisp never really becomes popular. It does, however, remain an influential language in key algorithmic techniques such as recursion and condescension. <laughs> 
After losing a bet with L. Ron Hubbard, Grace uh, Hopper, and several others invent the capitalization of boilerplate-oriented language. Years later, in a misguided sexist retaliation against Admiral Hopper, uh, Hopper's cobble work, Ruby conferences frequently feature misogynistic material. In 1964, um, John Kemney and Thomas Kurtz create BASIC, uh, an unstructured programming language for non-computer scientists. In, uh, in 1965, they go to 1964. <laughs> in 1970, Guy Steele and Gerald Sussman create Scheme. Uh, their work leads to a series of Lambda the Ultimate papers culminating in Lambda the Ultimate Kitchen Utensil. This paper becomes the basis for um, for a long-running but ultimately unsuccessful uh, run of late-night infomercials, lambdas are relegated to relative obscurity uh, until Java makes them popular by not having them. <laughs> in 1970, Nicholas Wirth creates Pascal, procedural language. Criti uh, critics immediately denounce Pascal um, due to its x colon equals x plus y syntax instead of the more familiar c like x equals x plus y. This criticism happens despite c not being invented yet. In 1972, this is where I get. Dennis Ritchie invents a powerful gun that shoots both forwards and backwards at the same time. He is slightly unsatisfied with the number of deaths and permanent maimings, so he goes on to invent C and Unix. <laughs> in 1980, Alan Kay creates Smalltalk and he invents the term object oriented. When asked what he means, he replies Smalltalk programs are just objects. When asked what objects are made of, he replies, objects. When asked again, he says, look, it's just objects all the way down. Until you get turtles. In 1983, Bjarne Sroster bolts everything he's ever heard of onto C to create C++. The resulting language is so complex that programs must be sent to the future to compile with Skynet. <laughs> Build time suffer. Skynet's motives for performing the service remains unclear, but spoke people of the future has said, there is nothing to be concerned about, baby, in an Austrian accent monotones. There is some speculation that Skynet itself is nothing more than a pretentious buffer overflow. Finally, in 1990, a committee formed by Simon Peter Jones, Paul Hudak, Philip Bardler, Aston Kutcher, and people for ethical treatment of animals creates Haskell, a pure, non-strict, functional language. It does get some resistance due to the complexity of using monads to control side effects. Wadler tries to appease the critics um, by explaining that a monad is just a monoid in the category of vendor functors. So what's really the problem? Thank you. <laughs> Go see the monad talk. Thank you, Jorgen. And I apologize for destroying the title of your talk on the slide. It just was too long and didn't fit. You're enjoying my jokes? Yeah. Good. I mean, I've got a bunch of them about umbrellas, but they go over your head. Um, Next up is Francis. Down goes up. Not been having hardware problems today or anything. I, no, so I gave a talk this morning about what's a random number and why should you care. And we established that, I think, to everyone's satisfaction, there's no such thing as a random number. Unfortunately, that, that was really cool. That was nice and simple, all over within a few minutes at the beginning of the 90-minute slot. And then suddenly everything went dark. Well, my screen did, and so did what I was projecting. I thought, oh, power cut in the room. Oh, well. Looked up. Everything else was still on. I thought, thinking about it, I did hear this little noise from the direction of my laptop. I tried pressing the power button, nothing. Loads of uh, support guys came charging in. We tried different power sources and things. Didn't work. After much faffing, managed to get some slides on my husband's laptop. Thank you, Steve. Unfortunately, didn't have all the right fonts there, didn't quite work out, and didn't have time to recompile the examples and without a laptop, I've still not been able to. So we were going to see some blobs randomly racing out of a paper bag. Unfortunately, they didn't. We just had blobs 
walking out of paper bag before the catastrophic hardware failure, which tells us why random numbers are actually cool, because they make things more fun. I'll try and get together some little shorts for YouTube and share what you would have seen had I not broken my laptop this morning. I'm going to press another button. It occurred to me once I'd wrapped up with this slide and said, well, there would have been a demo and my time is up. I'd missed out two slides. So I've coded my way out of a paper bag on several occasions and I'd written them up in a previous book. I think a few of you have read it. If you'd like to know more about machine learning or AI, come and talk to me. Kevlin's quite right. Loads of it's a lot of nonsense. But you can solve some interesting problems. Most of it really is doing some statistics and guesswork and just seeing if things work or not. This is cool stuff. If you can code you out of paper bag, come and tell me. Maybe you can do a little talk about it in another lightning talk another day. And the important thing I was going to say this morning is I've been practicing some C++ trying to get back up to speed with all the recent standards. And it's tremendous fun if you actually code a little example of something. And I've therefore started writing a C++ book. So Manning have given me a discount code. But you can apply that to any of their other products and it's valid for a couple of weeks from today. You can buy my book if you want. And there is a chapter in there on how to code your way out of a paper bag, of course. But there are loads of other books up there. And I just wanted this opportunity to share the two slides I forgot this morning due to adverse circumstances. And I haven't broken Pete's laptop, so there we go. Thank you, Fran. Yeah, I'm very glad you didn't destroy my laptop. Uh, what do you need to make a... It's financial advice for you, financial advice. What do you need to make a small fortune on the stock exchange? A large fortune, yes. Very good. So, uh, finally, we have... And I shudder and hesitate whilst we move furniture around. We... Uh, no, no, I don't need to tell another joke. Uh, we're going to finish off this evening's proceedings with Mr. Chris Oldwood, Mr. Dom Davis, and I apologise in advance. Are we on? Are we live? Don't, uh, oh. Are you on? Okay, fine. Thank you. Right. Welcome, everyone, to another round of ACCU Mastermind 2023, hosted by me, Domus Domnison. And can I have the next contestant up on stage, please? Round of applause, everyone. And our next contestant is... Uh, Ronnie Corber, a, finance, uh, a, a freelance software engineer based in Cambridge. And your chosen specialist subject? Uh, failure modes in software engineering from 1968 to the present day. Welcome, Mr. Corber. You now have four minutes to answer as many questions as possible on failure modes in software engineering starting now. In IBM parlance, an ab end is a shorthand for what kind of failure? Abnormal end. Correct. The unscheduled disassembly of Ariane 501 in 1996 was caused by what software malfunction? Uh, integer overflow. Correct. The public display of a software system undergoing failure is more commonly known by what popular name? A Kevlin Henny. Correct. <laughs> in message queuing systems, what is it impossible to guarantee? Exactly once delivery. Correct. Globally, what is the largest contributor to machine downtime? Uh, pass. Okay. Which law, taken to the extreme by Excel's date-passing logic, has seen the genome... Uh, postals. Uh, be liberal in what you expect. I'll accept that. In message queuing systems, what is it impossible to guarantee? Uh, exactly once delivery. Correct. <laughs> what do you call baffling code that uses error handling to control program flow? Uh, exceptional. Correct. <laughs> Which technique... <laughs> Which technique is commonly used to avoid failures caused by processing messages multiple times? Uh, item potency. Correct. What confusing BIOS error message was commonly displayed at boot time when no keyboard was plugged in? Uh, press F1 to continue. Correct. <laughs> in UDP, packets larger than the maximum segment size are subject to what potential issue? Uh, Fracket pigmentation. I'm sorry, I can only accept the answer I have on my card. Oh, uh, packet fragmentation. Correct. Which language doesn't even, uh, which doesn't even support the pointers suffers from them continually being null? Java. Correct. Which computer science term is used to describe multiple processes that are blocking each other from making any progress? Uh, pass. Which, uh, what technique is commonly used to avoid failures caused by processing messages multiple times? Idempotency. Incorrect. The answer I was looking for was your previous one of idempotency. 
The visionary writer Douglas Adams provided what advice on error handling to future Golang programmers, despite the language being, not being invented for another 40 years? Uh, don't panic. Correct. In VBA, what technique is commonly used to mask errors in your own code, thereby, allow, thereby allowing you to pass the blame onto somebody else's code? Uh, on error, resume next. Correct. Which technique is commonly used in distributed systems to avoid waiting indefinitely for a response? I'll repeat the question. Which technique is commonly used in distributed systems to avoid waiting indefinitely for a response? Going to have to hurry you. OK. Which computer scientist famously described, famously described Null as uh, Time out. I'm sorry. The correct answer I had was <laughs> Sir Tony Hall. In assembly language, how do you? Should be a buzzer sound there. Beep, 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 beep. I've started, so I'll finish. In assembly language, how do you avoid reentrancy problems when handling I.O. completion? Uh, disable interrupt. Correct. And that marks the end of this round of ACCU Mastermind 2023. Congratulations, Mr. Corber. You've scored a total of 15 points. You passed on just two questions. The first was globally, what is the largest contributor to machine downtime? Pass it to the audience, anyone? The correct answer is indeed installing Windows updates. <laughs> uh, the second was uh, multiple processes blocking each other from making progress is known in computer science as what? Now, I'm sure you'll remember it's a deadlock. Uh, I think you'll find it's a live lock. No, my answer card has a, a, a deadlock. I, I beg to differ. I think you'll find it's called a live lock. Uh, no, no, I, I, I think you'll find it, it's actually a, a, a deadlock. Uh, no, I think your question card is wrong. It's definitely sounds exactly like a well, live lock. This question card has been put together by a bunch of experts, and they have said that it is a deadlock. I, I, well, I, you're wrong. I, uh, I, I, I have to you stop need, you there. You gonna, well, you need to accept I'm right. I have to stop you there and ask you, is it the five-minute argument or the full half hour? <laughs> I think that's another talk. <laughs> Nothing to apologize for at all. Um, I don't trust atoms. They make up everything. OK, thank you very much, everyone. Let's just, uh, let's just uh, ooh, look back at that whole list of wonderful people. Let's give a round of applause to Dom, to Jim, to Kevin, to Andy, to Felix, to Matthew, to Roger, to Jorgen, to Francis, to Chris, and to Dom again. Wonderful. Thank you.